thank you all for joining us today for our uh, our panel with our excellent panelists. So what we're going to do to kick it off is have our three panelists take a few minutes just to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about kind of what's on their mind related to uh, what we're going to be discussing today. And then we'll jump into my questions and um, hopefully we'll be able to take some audience questions as well. So let's start. Um, Joni Newhart, will you kick it off? Sure, Will. Thank you so much, Marjorie. I'm very glad to be here today. Thanks to everybody for joining. Um, I'm the Associate Administrator for Acquisition Workforce Programs at the Office of Management and Budget. And as such, I try to orchestrate the skills of the world's largest buying workforce. So uh, thank you to all the contracting folks who've joined us and the acquisition folks for all the work that you've done in this crazy, crazy year. Um, we have a lot of things going on at the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, and I'm going to be really excited to share some of those with you, as well as what's going on in the civilian agencies. So thank you. Lou Von Thayer, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Marjorie. I'm Lou Von Thayer. I'm the president and CEO of Battelle uh, Memorial Institute. We're the largest uh, independent R&D organization in the world and primarily a federal contractor. So we just closed our last year a little over $9 billion. And uh, most of our money comes from the federal government in one form or another, either through uh, research, um, R&D, uh, science, or, or the defense side. So uh, very happy to be here today and um, be able to talk a little bit about uh, how we've been able to work with the government back and forth uh, through this crisis. Thanks. And Kim Harrington. Thanks, Marjorie. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I'm Kim Harrington, uh, work in acquisition sustainment uh, for the Undersecretary of Defense, Ellen Lord. Uh, for the last two years, up until about a month ago, I was the Principal Director for Defense Pricing and Contracting, uh, serving in, in an acting capacity, and we fortunately were able to uh, fill uh, that position just recently, and now uh, Ms. Lord has me supporting uh, industrial policy. Uh, so uh, so I, I've sort of seen uh, all sides of, uh, of working with industry from both, both vantage points. Wonderful. We'll jump into um, some questions. First, let's talk about how um, the pandemic kind of immediately affected your organizations. What was what were maybe the first few things you had to do, kind of the steps you had to take um, to react to this? And, and I'll um, let you raise hands to see who wants to go first. Well, I don't mind going first. Uh, so, uh, it, it, we talk about inside the building a lot about, uh, uh, you know, when the NBA canceled uh, uh, their season early on, on March 8th or 9th or whatever. Uh, and, uh, you know, so obviously we understood there was some serious things going on, even though, you know, there were some precursors to that. Um, but but then you know that that really signaled that uh, that organizations were were considering very drastic measures, whether it's a company or or a government uh, agency or a, a state. Uh, and so within a week, then we started having uh, uh, very frequent calls with industry. They started uh, with industry associations. They started every day for a while, and then we went to three times a week and. And uh, so within the first couple of weeks of the pandemic really hitting, um, you know, we were seeing defense companies that uh, were closing because of, uh, of uh, you know, some infections uh, or uh, governors uh, mandating that companies close. And so, so the, the very first things were in order to uh, really try to make sure that we didn't have a degradation to our programs and impacting, um, you know, national defense was really trying to figure out how we could keep companies working uh, safely, but but and where they could, but working. And so, uh, a lot of that work went into, uh, you know, uh, identifying the defense industrial base as critical infrastructure, uh, and we had a lot of guidance relative to that. We had. Um, guidance issued to ensure that uh, we can maximize telework uh, with companies and, and where, where possible. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, the department did things like uh, uh, raising our progress payment rate that injected cash flow uh, where we saw, you know, pretty immediate needs 
uh, with companies starting to really struggle, especially down the supply chain. So there were, of course, many other things, but all, but all of those things sort of hit within the first few weeks of, of uh, when the pandemic became, uh, you know, sort of real and, and known across the country. Right. We were Joni, you want to jump in? Joni, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow. It all happened so fast. And um, we were trying to help our agencies um, understand what they could do. Um, you know, there, we had to, uh, we've always had trouble communicating. Um, so we set up a website on acquisition.gov specifically for coronavirus um, direction and policy and all of that to try and communicate both with industry, uh, like Kim said, and with our, our government folks. For us personally, trying to get into the cadence of teleworking, just like all of you watching probably was, you know, there has to be a start and a stop point to the work because otherwise you can just like keep floating on at home doing all this work and you're like, oh wait, it's, you know, eight o'clock at night or something. So trying to strike that work-life balance. Um, and I think the last piece for me personally was we were in the midst of our acquisition workforce 2025 effort, trying to get ready for next week really, but we had the mark on the wall for 2025. And we really wanted a lot of feedback and outreach. And so all of a sudden we were faced with, we couldn't have our meetings, but what really was a blessing that came out of that was using our Zoom platform. We were able to reach people all over the country, people that we wouldn't have thought to reach before. And we got such good feedback. Um, and everybody's been very thoughtful about in how we can get ready for the future in this, especially in this new crazy, crazy world. Um, so let's turn it over to Lou. Thanks. Uh, so we, it was interesting for us. Um, I'm fortunate that I work with a lot of microbiologists, uh, people who work on things uh, geared toward pandemics, chemical weapons, things like that. So we had a lot of advice coming in as this was starting to show up in China. So I remember in January, there was a day when Singapore went from, I think, two cases to 100 in one day. And I met with our leadership team that day and said, okay, it's coming here. Let's figure out what we're gonna do about it. So that extra month, month and a half that we kind of planned on this made a huge difference. Um, for us, it was a few things. One, about a th half our people can't work at home. Uh, they're, they're in lab, they're running in labs, they're uh, doing work in skips, they're doing things that just can't be done remotely. So we had to lay out a plan for how we were going to do our own testing. We developed our own tests, which ended up being a state test in Ohio. Um, we laid out policies to get everybody else the heck out of the office, which we moved to in, in March a little bit before the government mandates to do that, and really focused on safety and how we could stay up and running. The second piece was we knew we didn't have the technology platform to do this, uh, and, and we saw that when we first came out. So we started expanding our tech platform, uh, not as much Zoom at first uh, because of some of the security issues, but uh, you know WebEx and Microsoft Teams and deployed those things pretty extensively, uh, which wasn't all smooth, but but worked out pretty well. And and then we worked closely. Uh, I worked with the governor's office uh, to make sure, just like uh, Kim spoke of, that that the important parts of our industry and where our customers had national security needs um, were deemed essential and we could keep those running during those times. And finally, what was the most interesting part, which I think made it especially busy for us, but also gave us a real sense of mission uh, because we were in a position where we could help with the pandemic. We set our folks loose to figure out what they could do and actually came up with a number of solutions of testing, mask cleaning, a number of things where we could actually uh, make a difference. And uh, we started those projects in parallel with all this, so it was a busy time. Uh, to be honest, it's the first time in a decade or so that I've consistently worked 100 hour weeks and I'm too old for that. And my most of my team was doing that as well. Um, but I think through it, we were, we were pleasantly surprised at how well we've been able to do through all this, kind of inventing it as we went. So Lou, I think you brought home one of the common threads among all three of you, which is how fast uh, you, know, you had to move as an organization, how many, how many decisions you had to make. Um, you know, for each of you, were there any surprises, good or bad, things that maybe went better or worse than you expected or, or um, benefits that you were able to reap? I can start this one if it's all right. Uh, so interestingly, uh, probably the, I think two surprises. One, when we 
first saw this and saw how infectious it was, we actually had it in our labs. Um, I expected the outbreak to be much worse. Um, and I was, I think the shutdowns early on made a, made a huge difference. And obviously we're seeing some issues again today that uh, hopefully won't lead to shutdown that we have to deal with. But I think we were pleasantly surprised at how well the distancing mask, um, the other strategies worked, uh, although not perfect. Uh, the second thing is in places, particularly where we have transactional items, um, we started out maybe a little bit chaotic. Our customers slowed down a little bit, but I think today, um, I, I look at procurement. It's more efficient today doing these things remotely and working with our customers than it ever was before. Um, and when I talk to my team, you know, they, they're just so happy that, um, you know, they can send a procurement officer a note in, in the old days, that person would be in a meeting, they'd get the note an hour later, the secretary would schedule a meeting two weeks after that, you know, it'd be a months long process to go through, go through a negotiation to get something done. Um, now, you know, the, our head of procurement typically gets a note back within an hour or two after that person finishes their meeting. They set up an online meeting. We're redlining in real time. Uh, the process has gotten much more efficient. And I think our team feels like they have much more contact with the customers than we were able to before, uh, which we're very appreciative of. So I think that's a really nice surprise and one of those lessons learned that hopefully we won't forget after this is all over. Yeah, and in our case, um, so we have a very small office, maybe 15 people. And so we always just could walk down the hall and, and touch base with somebody or have a chat about a, a topic. And I was really afraid that when we all went to telework that I would kind of lose that, but actually it's, it's gotten better. So we all touch base uh, almost every morning. And so we're constantly communicating. That's been really, really wonderful. Um, so it, that, that's been a real blessing. And I would add, uh, you know, so I, I, I guess, you know, the department probably has a little bit of a reputation of being able to respond to crisis situations. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that's that's really what we saw happen was was uh, just a, a laser focus on on whatever the, the, the particular organization's role was. And, and uh, you know, so I, I think we saw productivity increase as uh, as Lou and Joni uh, noted, uh, I, I think there was a tremendous amount of, of work got done uh, just because everybody was just focused on the task. We understood the importance of, you know, not only the, the pandemic side of things, but to make sure that the department still could operate and keep going while we focused on trying to get all of the, uh, from a contracting standpoint, all of the actions done from, from the pandemic side of things. So, so that was a really... Um, I, I don't want to say a surprise, but I, I didn't expect it to go as well as it did, especially given we had a lot of challenges from an IT standpoint uh, early on, uh, just because nobody could have expected, you know, close to a million people all of a sudden needing to connect remotely uh, and trying to do that all at one time. Um, the other thing that I, I think was really uh, good, and I alluded it to uh, earlier, and 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 Lou mentioned it as well, is just the communication uh, with industry. And and as I mentioned early on, I mean, we had uh, you know folks uh, that uh, associations that have people you know in the Middle East and couldn't get out or couldn't get in or whatever the case may be, uh, and we we could hear that information and and literally within an hour start getting on the phone and start working that and and so things that literally would have taken months as lou said um it were happening in hours uh and that that close collaboration and communication really uh was was uh was a little surprising that it went so smoothly and was so effective and again i do agree that that's something that we need to make sure that we don't lose as we uh, hopefully, uh, maybe with some vaccines in a few months, um, you know, maybe get more back to normal, but we don't lose that that ability to communicate and collaborate. Yeah, I think um, we'll definitely want to spend some time talking about what should stay. Um, one of the pieces I wanted to talk about on that for a second is that I think Joni alluded to is how um, DC centric sometimes government contracting can be and how the pandemic may may or may not have affected that. I know, Lou, you're not based in DC, but I'm sure you still feel the, the pull of, of customers here. Um, how do you think that that has shifted in this or, or will shift? Do you think it could um, kind of have a permanent effect on, on um, DC as the center of it all? 
Yeah, well, I lived in D.C. till three years ago, so I certainly understand both sides of this. Um, I think it's going to really depend. And I think after this, there's going to be some cultural challenges, uh, big bureaucracies and, and Defense Department's a great organization I've worked with it my entire career, but it is a big bureaucracy. And the question is going to be how much do you keep and how much don't you? And we're thinking through that in our company as well. Um, I think innovation and um, culture are the areas that, that are at risk if you're not careful and you do too much remotely. But I do think in transactional areas like procurement, uh, this can be done pretty well remotely. And we've proven that. And I think at our company, we've got that lesson and, and we're very happy with it. Uh, when I talk to my team and they deal with the folks and the contracting officers all over the country, um, they get a mixed response. Some of them are still nervous about whether they can trust their employees still to be efficient in the long term, uh, some of those typical things, whether it will be culturally acceptable or not. But I think if the leadership in, can, can help drive through that some of these changes are you know, really strong and really powerful and really can add efficiency and can keep that so we don't lose track of this, after the pandemic's over, I think it'd be really promising. I, I do caution everyone. I've talked to a lot of people about, you know, preparing for pandemics. And uh, part of my thesis after living, you know, in this industry for pushing 40 years now is we are awesome at responding as a country. We are lousy at planning and our memories tend to be very short. And I think it's about a three year lifespan of um, worrying about what happened here after this is over compared to other things that are going on and all the pressures the build. And I think for us to take those gains and make sure that some of them become embedded in those learning is going to be important. I don't think it'll happen automatically. I think that gets into the culture of a large organization where it takes a lot of people to agree and to work it. And I think that's that's a hard thing to do, but it's, it's certainly worth the effort if we can make it happen. I know it's going to happen on the corporate side, at least in my organization, because we've seen too many benefits. We're, you know, we're 30,000, not millions. So it's a lot easier to get our arms around it. Um, but But we're sold. I like to say that the train has left the station and we're not going back. <laughs> I, I've been so pleased that all the feedback reaching out to the frontline folks all over the country has really been beneficial, hugely beneficial. And I'm not going to settle for anything less from now on, that's for sure. Um, so from now on, this is going to be my way to operate. And it's, it's, I think it's made the whole government better by us all coming together. Wow, Joni, did, what do you what do you mean by that when you say this is the I mean that anyone can work remote at any time? Well, I mean, I guess, or maybe you're still working out the specifics, but could you elaborate a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so our office, I've been so pleased with the support that we've had to stay safe. And um, I was telling the panelists earlier that I had to go into my office yesterday for the first time in nine months to switch out my computer, and uh, I felt really safe. But yet. Yeah, there's a lot of support to do what you feel comfortable doing. Um, so completely teleworking is, is wonderful, but I think the, the best part of it is just reaching out to people and hearing from you know, our folks, our procurement folks, our colleagues all across the country and letting them know we want to hear from them and it's important what they think and then building strategies to make their lives better. You know, In the next few years, there's gonna be so much that's changing, the emerging technology and everything. We want to get it right. We can't do it alone. So we're relying on them to help. And they've been a, an amazing help. Kim, did you want to jump in on this or anything bad? Well, I, I, I you know, so I, I, I think there's there's going to be a little bit of a, of a, of a leadership challenge, right? Because um, while I do agree that, that uh, you know the, the 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 change in telework philosophy is is significant and will be lasting. Uh, I know in prior to the pandemic, uh, I hired my director of pricing, and we thought the best person uh, was in Dayton, Ohio, and we were going to let her stay there. Uh, and everybody was just freaking out over, well, how is that going to work? You know, I mean, you're in the Pentagon and, and, you know, that just doesn't make any sense. And then of course, you know, a few months later, everybody is remote. And so, oh, that's not a big deal anymore. Um, but, but, and, and so I, I think that that's important and significant. I think it opens up the ability to really recruit and, and think about where the where you can find the best talent and it doesn't have to be right next door or, or be in your building. So that's that's significant. But I do think that we'll have to look at things like how do you develop people 
when you're solely in a, a, a virtual environment? How do you ensure that um, you know everybody is 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 properly aligned and and that uh, and that uh, you know you're caring for everybody in terms of making sure that they're informed and and you know and so it's not impossible. Uh, again, I think we we everybody's demonstrated it can be done, but I, those are some long term things that I think if you got two and three years into a sort of a telework. Uh, arrangement as term, uh, in terms of a primary means of working that you've got to, you're going to have to grapple with some of those issues. One of the stories yeah. I really liked um, was I was on a panel with Jim Woolsey, who's the president of DAU. Hi, Jim, if you're out there. Um, he was talking about how within one week they had to go from classroom training to virtual online training. And he said it wasn't pretty, but nobody, if it hadn't been for the pandemic, you know, without fail, people said, no, we can't do that. Possible, well, no way we can do that. But they did it and they were forced to do it. And he, like he said, they, they can't necessarily go back the way they were either. So I, I thought that was a really impactful story. I would add, yeah. just, if, if I could add one final point, Marjorie, too. I think although this stuff has worked great, and as I said, I think for transactional parts of our business, it works well. You know, we are finding in places like innovation, uh, like Kim spoke of, really building the culture and the training. You know, we're going to have to learn how to do those things better. And I, and if you look at, you know, Battelle's an R&D company, and if you look at most of the best inventions we have, most of them come from cross-disciplinary purposes. And a lot of times that cross-disciplinary stuff happens by accident. It's the, uh, the accidental meeting in the hallway or the cafeteria or somebody, you know, complaining about a problem they're having in biology and somebody did something similar in a different regime in mechanical engineering before and they come together to come up with something cool. I don't think we figured out how to replace that yet. And I think it's going to be how do we I think it's going to be a hybrid when we come back for us. Um, but I do think it's some of the transactional places, if you're doing accounts payable, procurement, places where you're largely dealing with people that aren't next to you anyway, most of the time. I think those are the places where this works really well. And then we're going to I suspect we'll end up with more flexibility um, for other folks they might have had before and expect them to be in all the time. But we'll still want to make sure enough of those cross interactions can take place. Right. It sounds like, um, you know, a big part of this is culture and, you know, the culture of a given organization, um, but it also sounds like some of it is is infrastructure and technology. Do you think, um, you know, what was put in place or already existed before this time is sufficient, or do you think additional um, investments or focus there could make, uh, could improve kind of the ability to to work remotely, to, to um, collaborate remotely, that kind of thing? I think it'll continue to get better. Uh, if you look at how we started, uh, most of us didn't even know how to use Microsoft Teams, especially those of us that were more senior and maybe not used to dealing with a lot of this stuff ourselves. Uh, Zoom was a mess, right? I mean, it took about, uh, I could have even hacked into a Zoom call in the early days. And uh, uh, But you look at how far we've come, how teams have learned, uh, how new products have come out. And I, I think we've seen an acceleration uh, that's gonna only get better over time. So I think it'll continue to get better. Um, but I, I still think there are some things that that face to face is better for once in a while, and it's going to be hard to replace that. Like we have one training that we do in our DOE business um, that we actually tried, and we decided we're going to wait till to start that back up again because it's, it's just too hands on. It doesn't work well remotely. But I would say for the vast majority, we're finding that maybe while not perfect, we can get 80, 90 percent of the benefit, and we can do it more efficiently uh, than we could from everybody getting on a plane and coming together. So I, I anticipate we'll continue to learn from this and the tools will get better and better as long as there's a demand for them. And I suspect that'll stay. Yeah, in regard to the tools, I still have meetings where it's on Microsoft Teams and we can't use it. I know somebody can't use Zoom Gov and I'm looking forward to the day where those barriers are kind of removed and we can all either platforms talk to each other or <laughs> we can all use the same platform. We're not quite there yet. Great. I'm going to, uh, we're getting a couple audience questions. So I'm going to insert a couple of these. Let's start with the first one was many small businesses have stated they are having problems communicating with government personnel as they're trying to introduce products and services to potential government clients. They are not getting any response from emails and phone calls are not being answered due to the work from home. How should these small businesses move forward? Anyone have thoughts on that one? I do. Uh, so Soraya Correa at the Department of Homeland Security, she's the uh, chief procurement officer. She set up this group called the, where is it? COVID Procurement and Acquisition Innovation Response Team. 
And that's a group that um, any inquiries are funneled to them and they sort of parse out which ones are, are effective or which ones need to be pursued and then they'll send it to the right agency. So that that's a pretty good venue. Um, and I think you might be able to find that at the acquisition.gov slash coronavirus site I mentioned earlier. And if for some reason it's not there, I'll make sure it's there in a couple hours. I think the question, you know, certainly isn't unique to the COVID situation. Uh, I would say that that's a pretty standard fare of, of uh, companies always wanting to try to get an audience for their ideas and their products. Um, so, you know, what I would say is, you know, uh, Lou said it perfectly. I mean, the department is a rather large bureaucratic organization. It's hard not to be when you're basically the size of a country and, and spend about as much as a country does, uh, at least most, most in the world, uh, and with locations everywhere and all of that type of stuff. So it's a challenge. But, but you know, I, 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 I would say hang in there with us. Uh, I, I think we're getting better. If you look at what all of the services have done, and I'll just use the Air Force as an example, but, but all of the services have done this, you know, the, the, where the Air Force have, have really um, initiated and, and really expanded on their concept of their pitch days, uh, where, where they're, they've been awarding contracts real time, uh, i.e. in a day, the same day, um, you know, think Shark Tank type of uh, the, the television show type of process where you come in and, and pitch your idea. Um, and, and so, you know, again, all of our services have, have similar type of mechanisms where they're really trying to get, uh, you know, outreach to, uh, to innovative companies. And so, again, it's, it's, you know, we haven't completely solved the issue of the problem. I don't know that we'll ever will because there's, there's always going to be somebody who's got a new idea and a new process, a, a new product that's going to want to get in front of somebody. And as you might imagine, uh, the folks that are engaged in those type of endeavors, they, they, they get those type of requests all day long, every day. Uh, so, so being able to focus and figure out who the right uh, ones are. But, but I think we're getting better at it, but there's certainly more work to be done. Okay, the, the next question from the audience is, how do we bring on new young people and train them as 1102s in this virtual environment? How do they get the shared experience that happens in an office environment? That's, that's a great question, actually. Um, and it's part of our Acquisition Workforce 2025 plan. One of the things we heard from the frontline folks was that their best experience when they came into the government was to come in as a cohort. Um, and to have other people to have this shared experience with. So how do we do that in this environment? I think um, one key thing is there's programs out there that switch to virtual that still connect people. Uh, one that comes to mind is the Partnership for Public Service Leadership Excellence and Acquisition Program. Um, they're still connecting people. But I think another key thing is it's this whole on-camera debate. So we'll be in staff meetings and some people call in they're not on camera, but the minute you get the people on the camera, for some reason, it's that connection. Like you get to see somebody, you get to see a friendly face, you get to put a face with a name. I think that's key. And then I think that um, acquisition organizations really can set up these mentoring uh, platforms so that the new people coming in can connect through Zoom or however virtually with other people in the organization one-on-one. -on -one. And I think that will get them a connection and maybe also with their peers. So. There's certainly ways to do that. It's just a matter of um, using the tools. And I, I, I think it can be just as effective. And I think what Lou said earlier is, is really where things are gonna settle down, which is there's gotta be a, a sort of a mix. There's gotta be a combination of uh, where you can do things virtual, uh, whether even if we're post pandemic, whether that's just for flexibility in, in, uh, in, in a work environment, but, but you know, uh, I think people were probably created to be social creatures. And so there, there needs to be this interaction. Uh, so I, I do think there's a mix. Clearly, companies and governments are going to look and say, you know, do we really need all these buildings uh, and spending all of this money on leasing office space? And maybe you don't need to have that. And so maybe there's going to be this idea of, of, you know, shared spaces and, and less footprint. 
But but all of that said, I, I think there's going to be a mix. I think there's some things that you have to do uh, face to face and interact and and bring people along. It was I alluded to that before in terms of of developing people, and and there's just some things that are really hard to do uh, just solely virtually. So I think it'll be a mix and, uh, people will experiment. There'll be best practices about how to do these things. Uh, and we'll all learn from each other. I can add on the, cor oh, on the corporate ahead, side, no, this, this has been one of our biggest concerns and issues. Um, so again, I, I I'm sure we'll go back to a hybrid in time, but today what we're doing is we're trying to take advantage of the, the good parts of being remote is that it's easy and cheap to get people together. So we're trying to invent lots of mechanisms to get people together. Everything from, I used to do a quarterly all hands to the team. I do one every two weeks now, but it's easy. I don't, nobody gets on a plane. Um, you know, it doesn't take a lot of prep anymore. We spend half of it doing Q and a, but it's just more frequent. And we've created lots of employee resource groups. We've moved our onboarding and training online. Um, I, I think, but I think this part's really important or it's easy to get a lot of people that do their work every day, but never really get connected to the organization. And um, I'm a firm believer that the culture kind of wins over everything else in the end, even good strategies and execution will be undermined if you can't build a culture. And I think our ability to do that uh, as well as we can in this environment and then some hybrid in the future is going to determine which organizations are most successful. Uh, you know, I wanted to go back to, to Kim. I thought it was interesting, your anecdote about um, hiring someone who would be working in a different city and for, you know, and, and collaborating with, with people in the Pentagon. Um, it sounds like you think some of the biggest changes might be in this workforce piece in terms of how you can recruit and retain. Um, I'm hoping you can elaborate a little bit on that, not, not just Kim. Um, and also whether it might change some contract requirements, you know, maybe... Um, the extent that we can get into kind of how it might affect some of the nitty gritty things that that'd be interesting too. Um, maybe Kim, do you want to kick us off there? Sure. Well, I mean, you know, what I was alluding to was, uh, in fact, we had another example uh, where, um, you know, a, a person uh, really from their, uh, their uh, life situation needed to be closer to uh, a parent to try to care and, and, uh, you know, in if we hadn't had the the experience that, gee, telework can work, you know, that would have been a situation where we likely would have lost that employee. They we would have said, nope, you know, you got to be in D.C. or else it doesn't work. And they would have had to find a job in, in another state to accomplish what they needed to do. And we would have lost a, a good employee. Whereas as soon as it came up, it was like, sure, go ahead. That, you know, <laughs> we can do that, right? So, so I think that, that that really opens up the aperture in terms of, of, of how you view your talent. And I think in recruiting talent too, uh, where, where before, you know, you get, a, you get folk resumes and, and stuff and, and you say, oh, well, you know, now we're going to have to have relocation and all of this type of stuff. Well, maybe not. Um, so I think that the talent base opens up, but but, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, Joni talked about, uh, you know, how we, we train folks through DAU. I th again, I think that can be virtual. But again, I, it, I, I still believe that there's going to be, as Lou said, sort of these cultural imperatives where, where you bring people together for sure to, to accomplish certain things. And so, uh, so I, I think that, that that's, again, it's just going to be a hybrid. It's going to be a mix. In terms of specifics, you know, again, one of the early guidance documents that we sent out was around telework because, you know, government contracts typically structured of, I tell you whether you can telework or not. And if I haven't told you, you can, then you can't. Um, and so we had a lot of uh, contracts that didn't say that people could. And all of a sudden, you know, now we can't execute. So, so we had to send guidance out that said, you know, hey, you need to rethink this. So, so again, I think there are specific things that, that will be structured differently as we go forward. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We, um, we have these uh, Acquisition Excellence Awards every year. And last year, the nominations closed, I wanna say like March, right when the pandemic hit and people were just too, busy doing pandemic related things to provide nominations. So we extended it for several months and we specifically asked for pandemic innovations. And we got some really excellent, excellent nominations and winners. Uh, for example, the winner of the Acquisition Excellence Individual Award was uh, Hillary Cole at the USDA. And she and her colleagues developed this uh, Farmers to Families Food Program. 
So all the farmers who would have had to throw some food away because they couldn't quite get to the right people, um, they got 500 uh, proposals for this program. They evaluated it with them within a week. They ended up awarding 329 contracts within a week, uh, nearly $4 million. And since then, they've connected uh, 118 million boxes of food with nonprofits to get the food that would have been wasted to the people that need it. And that's the kind of thing that uh, besides work, it's a wonderful work story, but it's just a wonderful human story. And it's, it's so nice to hear things like that. Um, great. We have another question from the audience that I will uh, read. Even in this environment, some agencies are still requiring hard copy proposal submittals. Is that realistic and maybe a place in which we could change our government practices? Yes. <laughs> maybe I'll add on behalf of the question asker, what would it take you think to change those government practices? Shouldn't be hard. I mean, uh, again, uh, and I don't know whether that's a DOD uh, reference or not, but uh, uh, I, I think uh, for the for the overwhelming majority, we have uh, tried to knock down barriers. I know, again, uh, the, the, the DPC office uh, issued uh, uh, a number of things that got rid of hard copies, signed copies, stamped copies, all of these types of things. We, we pretty much, wherever we could, somebody, as soon as somebody raised a question, we said, okay, we don't need to do that. Um, you know, so, so uh, you know, again, I, I think um, it's just really a commitment to efficiency and, and trying to embrace doing things differently. Uh, and uh, there's all sorts of ways you can try things. You don't, you know, you don't always have to change everything permanently forever. You can do pilots and see if things work. And if they don't, then go back. But, but certainly it seems like uh, we should be able to get beyond, uh, um, you know, certain things that, uh, you know, and do things electronically, especially in this environment. And one thing from our office that we started doing before the pandemic hit was, uh, a periodic table of acquisition innovations. One thing that we've always been really challenged by is getting the stories, getting the best practices, getting the ideas. And so this was an effort to collect those in a better way, best practices. So it's on uh, FAI.gov. And what it is, it's uh, the acquisition life cycle broken out into the different steps. And then within each step, there are several different um, acquisition innovations that we're hoping people will take advantage of. So they're proven practices, there's samples, there's templates. So if you have an acquisition and you go to this periodic table, you can try and figure out, you don't have to try everything, just try a couple things. And a lot of times just like the hard copy proposals, that's, that's not a requirement in anything. Anybody can just change their mind by doing it. And I suggest, um, I've always heard that, oh, it's the lawyers won't let you do it. Baloney, there's great lawyers out there, fine a great lawyer that you can connect with and, and figure these things out. It's not hard. Just, just do something and do it, uh, do it tomorrow, do it today. Jerry, for your information, this person uh, responds that it's not a DOD specific example. It's about DOI. So uh. <laughs> there you go. Um, one other area I wanted to uh, dig into a little more, I think Lou brought up was the, the productivity piece, which um, some of that seems to be perception. Some of that is probably measurable, quantifiable. Um, it seems like early on productivity was high because it had to be. How have you seen it um, kind of as we've gone along in, in each of your organizations? Well, I can start. Um, yeah, we saw it went very high at first, like most people probably saw. And we just uh, we kind of took that to be everybody was running on endorphins and they had to run out at some time. Uh, so in some areas, we probably seen the productivity slow down a bit as uh, as we've kind of come off the endorphins and settled into months and months and months of this. Uh, but again, the transactional areas like procurement, uh, some of these places where this is where we're developing our lessons learned, the places where the uh, efficiencies have stayed higher, where we can actually track, we're getting more negotiations done, more contracts signed, more vendors 
Uh, this one contract we did uh, on the mass program, we ended up signing up more than 20,000 sites the last time I looked across the country with separate contracts to be able to work and did that within weeks, um, thousands at first, hundreds a week later on. Uh, and, and this has worked really well. And, and these are the places um, where you kind of have these transactional items like uh, acquisitions, procurement, uh, accounts payable, where the people you're tending to work with anyway aren't next to you. They tend to be scattered around the country where the work's actually being done. Um, we found our efficiencies has gone up and has stayed there. Uh, so those are the places, at least on our side, that um, you know, I, I suspect in the future, I'll have a couple offices and a hoteling area in my building available for the, for the leaders and folks and let them kind of run the organization, whatever makes sense, as long as they can keep the efficiency up. I think that's been one of our most valuable learnings. Yeah, I think for us, um, we were really focused on all the pandemic related things for honestly for weeks and weeks. And then slowly but surely we said, okay, think this is, we're getting this under control. Let's not forget our priorities. Um, the president's management agenda, there's still things that we want to accomplish that are really important to government. So I think we've kept the pandemic focus, but then kind of shifted over to other things that we want to get done. Um, and so I, I feel like we were pretty productive and I'm pretty proud of what we've done. And um, it's great people all over the country besides those feedback meetings reach out with questions and everything. And it's just wonderful to connect with people. So if you, if you want to send us an email, please feel free to do that. We're, we're happy to hear from you at any time. Do you have anything to add on the productivity piece or should we up to you. I think it stayed pretty, pretty high. And again, I, my only concerns again would be, you know, long-term type of discussions, uh, um, you know, as, as, uh, as people, um, you know, get past all of the, you know, we did it, we accomplished it, you know, we responded um, and, and uh, you know, how do you, how do you maintain productivity in a, in a, in a marathon as, a, as a sp opposed to a sprint, but uh but yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there was also early on the danger that uh, we were going to burn people out. Uh, uh, agree with with Lou. I mean, we were we were running pretty hard for a for a long time because there was just so much to be done. Um, but you know, again, I, I think you know we'll find that that right level. And uh, but I, I, overall, I, I think uh, across the department, we've we've seen pretty reasonable, steady uh, uh, productivity. Uh, and, um, you know, even as we've fluctuated, at least within the Pentagon of everybody gone and then a lot of people back and people now moving out again, um, it, it stayed pretty constant. Um, I wonder if I might ask you all also to, to, to speculate a little bit, predict a little bit about the return to normal or whatever the new normal is, um, you know, do how do you start getting people maybe back in the office or doing some meetings or, um, you know, return the progress payments to normal? I, I, I don't know. What, what do you think that looks like? I, you know, I've sort of read that it's, um, it's not going to be, you know, one day we decided this is over, right? It's sort of going to be gradual. And I wonder if you're starting to think about that, that, um, that return and what it looks like. I think it's, it's a safety issue really for me. And I imagine, um, there's really gonna to have to be a case by case for each person. For example, I go see my, um, my mother's gonna be 91 on Saturday. And so, well, I might feel safe. I have to do everything I can to keep her safe. I know, I know folks have kids that aren't going back to school. So I think it's just gonna, we're just gonna to have to see how it goes. I don't see like them saying, everybody come back Monday. It's just, that's not gonna happen. Marjorie, maybe if I can just uh, twist it a little bit. I mean, I, I so yes, I, I agree with Joni. Um, you know, we'll have to see how vaccines work and all of that type of thing. And and I and I think you know uh, we could probably hope that you know maybe June of next year, if if you were in a position to, you could say, okay, we can quote unquote get back to normal. But there's some things that I think that are silver linings of uh, the pandemic. I, it you know, especially from a, a department's view. Um, we knew we had a problem in relying on foreign sources prior to 
the pandemic. We knew we had uh, fragility in our industrial base uh, and sole source issues um, even before. Uh, I, I want to say there was urgency to try to work at, at those issues, but I, I don't know that there was a, the highest level of urgency to really try to work those. Some of those problems have been around for many, many years, even decades. Um, and, and so um, I, I think what you've seen nationally, um, it, you know, not just certain, you know, wonks within the Pentagon or certain people in industry raising their hand, uh, but I think across the national spectrum, you've seen everybody sort of understand, gee, not a good idea maybe to be really reliant on your adversary for 100% of what you need, right? Whether it's pharmaceuticals, whether it's masks, gloves, um, you know, we can expand the topic into microelectronics. Uh, I think we've seen uh, during the pandemic, we've seen uh, what I would, you know, what Ms. Lord and others say is adversarial capital come in and try to take advantage of the weaknesses within the industrial base and, and try to invest and scoop up companies. Uh, so there's, there's all sorts of things that I think have really coalesced and come to light uh, where I think more, we're in a better position as a nation to say, I don't think this is what we want to do uh, and, and we need to do something different. Uh, and so I think that's gonna be one of the lasting lessons of the pandemic is, you know, where do we need to focus some onshoring activity? Where do we need to protect our supply chain? Uh, you know, and, and so I think those are the things that the department is really focused on as we try to come out of this pandemic. I think some of the, how many people are inside the building or the office, those will, that, that, that'll sort itself out as, again, we make informed choices about safety and the, the, the success of vaccines, et cetera. And, and other regimes of cleaning and distancing that are, that are appropriate. But I think these bigger issues around how, you know, sort of national strategies of how do we, you know, operate in terms of what's critical to, to make sure that we have a capability nationally, those are gonna be the really important lessons that, that we are learning and will learn. Well, and Marjorie, I'd like to first, uh, outside of my day job where I see this all the time, I also serve in the Defense Science Board, and and Kim hit one of the most important things on the head of, um, I think, the realizations we've known for a long time that are now getting priorities of uh, how adversaries in China and others are taking advantage of the openness of our system and, and us starting to prepare to fight back is really important. Uh, for us, you know, we've already brought back the people we need to to run our laboratories and set up the safety parameters. I don't anticipate bringing anyone else back on a regular basis until the vaccine, um, until the vaccines prove safe. And right now, we've told our people to, you know, expect that June first at the earliest. And we are we have a committee that's kind of looking at this and and making plans. But I, at this point, unless we end up seeing a business need to do it, I don't anticipate any other ways of bringing smaller portions back and putting them at risk until we really have vaccines, because we've proven we can do the other work uh, remotely, and there's no reason to take that risk. So like Joni and Kim talked to, it's it's really a matter of safety at this point, and, and we've done well so far. Why would we risk that coming into the home stretch with hopefully a vaccine out there that's going to work? Hopefully. Um, I see another question from the audience that I will read. Uh, it sounds like this is for our, our government folks. Has this transition to a teleworking environment positioned us to better compete with industry? We have discussed many pros, any major cons? Well, we've had a, a focus on um, uh, engaging with industry for, for years now. We've had a myth-busting series that amazingly some people still haven't haven't heard about, but there's four um, memos about how to engage better with industry. And I think um, a lot of the acquisition innovations have to do with engaging better with industry. I think we all see the benefit to that. So um, we welcome our, our industry partners in uh, all, all parts of uh, innovation and hope to make the acquisition process better along the way. You know, I'm not sure, but it sounds like also that the question might be about um, competing with industry in terms of hiring. Oh, hiring. Um, so that's interesting. Um, DOD and Kim might 
could probably talk better <laughs> to this than I do, but they're transforming their certification program. And for contracting, um, they're trying to make it more so that folks can go from DOD to civilian agencies, which they do a lot now, back and forth, and then also back and forth from industry, which I think getting at industry perspectives is, is really valuable. So I, I hope that kind of uh, door is open now with those new strategies. Kim, you might be able to talk to that a little better. Yeah, so uh, so we've, you know, and this is all working with DAU and, and Ms. Lord really had an initiative that she uh, is driving, uh, we called it back to basics. And uh, really what we found, even though the model probably worked for, for many years was that um, our, our training program was really, uh, you know, heavy training early in your career. Uh, and then, uh, and then, you know, you were, you, you got to a level of certification and, uh, and then, you know, sort of the learning stopped. Um, and, uh, what we're really trying to pivot to is a more flexible and a, and a, and a lifelong learning type of model uh, and a, a standardization, as Joni said, with uh, sort of commercial standards relative to certification. And so all of those things are in work, um, but what it means is uh, significantly fewer hours of training to become certified and then the creation of uh, more modulized training, what we're calling is, is um, credentialing. Uh, so where you would earn a credential when you need it for a particular skill. So for example, if you're starting off and you know, you're know you doing uh, base procurement uh, purchases and so you may be uh, doing the contract to you know, fix the roof on your building or, or buying the hamburger buns or whatever it is that, that you're doing, uh, you probably don't need the, the you know, really deep pricing skills of, of how to negotiate, uh, you know, the billion dollar uh, major defense program. Uh, uh, so instead of learning that, cramming that in, even when you don't need it, and then forgetting all about it when you actually do need it, uh, we would deliver that credential at a later time frame when you do need it. Um, and, 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 and like I said, have a more consistent uh, core training that matches sort of what uh, uh, you know, commercial practices are so that uh, there is that ability to move back and forth between, um, you know, government and industry and vice versa, as well as the other agencies. And, and just to kind of tweak that question a little bit for, for Lou, you know, I think there's also been this conversation about how to compete, um, how can government contractors compete with the tech industry um, which has been seen as maybe a little more forward thinking on both remote and then making their offices more fun or interesting or that kind of thing. Um, do you think that this changes that uh, calculus? Maybe. Um, you want to add a little extra spice to that, do it as a nonprofit. You know, Battelle doesn't take donations. We compete for everything we get, but it's the first nonprofit I've ever worked at. And at the size we are, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, so basically, instead of paying dividends, uh, which means I don't have stock options to give out, we, um, you know, we give that money away for STEM education. So it's, it's a new challenge I've had working here. And what I found is, which I think is the same thing the DOD probably uses to attract most of their people, is don't come here for the money, come here for the mission and, and the good that you can do. And because of that, we tend to attract people around that. And if you're just here looking for the money, you probably won't stay very long. Um, we've done remarkably well, though. Uh, I think you can still make a great living, uh, still be paid competitively, maybe not have the upside that you would in, uh, with some of the for-profit companies. But I think the mission is touching and compelling and, and grabs everybody on a regular basis. So I, I think you have to play to the strengths of your organization. And if you're a tech startup, you know, you're going to have lots of uh, cheap stock options and you'll use those to play. And if you're an organization like Patel or the DOD, you'll, you'll trade on uh, your give back to society and what you do and, and you'll attract people accordingly. Yeah. And um, just with, we just have a couple more minutes. So I just wanted to ask um, the panelists also, you know, when you're thinking about the workforce, um, I think that you kind of elaborating on what, what Lou is kind of hinting at is you have um, kids who are in high school now or in college and going through this, um, you know, very uh, affecting event. I, I wonder how, if you have any thoughts on how this might shape future workforce for both the government side and, and the industry side. 
Well, I think it might um, get more folks interested in the business of government. Like it's, it's really a calling to be in the, in the government workforce. I've had a, a pretty long career in it and you can be really impactful, for example, in an acquisition career. You can help any of the agencies, whatever your passion is, accomplish their mission. And you can't get that kind of impact, I don't think, anywhere else. So I hope um, it opens some people's eyes and they can are interested in coming to work with us. Yeah, I think it'll make for a savvier um, job hunter when they come out. You know, interestingly, uh, dealing with the millennials earlier and when they first started coming out, uh, you know, we typically couldn't keep them for more than a couple of years at for-profit companies I was at. They would just bounce around company to company, uh, you know, for a 5% raise. After the 2008-2009 recession, the kids that were going through high school and college then saw their parents suffer, saw job losses. Uh, and suddenly a new generation came out where uh, the conversations we were having to recruit really were around job security and uh, the longevity of the, of the company, which was dramatically different. And I suspect the, the kids that are going through this and quite frankly are missing parts of their education, or at least social parts now and, and seeing um, all the challenges around the country. I think that's going to, that's going to heavily form them. And um, I, I suspect they'll look for different things when they come out. And as, as the industry, we're going to have to learn more about that and adjust to it appropriately to attract them. And I would say every prediction that I would try to make is probably going to be wrong. So what I will say is that it, I think that means that we just need to be really mindful of being flexible, of really, of really trying to be uh, innovative, at least within government, where, which we don't have a sterling history necessarily of doing that. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think the, the pandemic and, and the pivot to telework and everything has really opened up a lot of eyes and minds about, you know, there, there is, you can be flexible, you can do things differently. Uh, and I think that's the mindset that's really important to, to maintain. And then, you know, a prediction of how uh, uh, it's going to affect future uh, hiring trends. I'm not really sure I'm qualified to, to talk about, but, but I think if we can say, hey, we're going to be flexible, we're going to be open, we're going to be innovative, we're going to look, embrace new ways of doing things, then that would be attractive to uh, future, uh, you know, uh, workforces. Just want to thank all three of our panelists for joining me today. Um, it was a really interesting conversation, and I thank you all for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now we got a short break. Thanks again, uh, Joni and Lou and Kim and Marjorie. Great panel. And now we've got a ten-minute break for our next. Uh, this starts at uh, nine twenty with on contract performance. So thanks again for all our panelists, and look forward to. Uh, uh, following up with you personally and um, to see you on the next panel.